Hello, my name is Stephen Barani. I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the panel Peace with Justice in Colombia? This webinar has been organized by three organizations in partnership. First, the Center for International Policy Studies at the University of Ottawa with the Just Governance Group, as well as the Latin American and Caribbean Study Group of the Canadian International Council. The Havana Peace Accord signed by the State of Colombia and the FARC EP guerrilla in 2016 offers a basis to redress conflict and unsustainable development in Colombia. As one of our panelists, Wade Davis, has written, rarely in history has a nation state been given such an opportunity to envision its future and such a reprieve from the industrial forces that have devastated so much of the world over the past half century. Now, some parts of that accord are being implemented, yet Colombian human rights activists worry that key parts of plans for transitional justice, or TJ, for the truth about past violations to be recognized, for the accused to be tried, for affected communities to be compensated and for the country to begin the long process of reconciliation, that those, some of those important agreements, commitments are being blocked. So what is the state of peace implementation today, almost five years after the Havana Accords were signed? Where is their progress? Where is it being blocked? particularly with regards to transitional justice. Why? Why, given the agendas and the power relations of key national and international stakeholders? And finally, what does this all mean for the vision of a new Colombia evoked earlier? We're very fortunate today to have three panelists who have expertise on different pieces of the Colombian puzzle. Wade Davis is a professor of anthropology and BC leadership chair in cultures and ecosystems at risk at the University of British Columbia. He is also the author of the book Magdalena River of Dreams. He will provide an overview of peace implementation and its prospects in Colombia. Then Paula Jimenez a Bogota-based expert on gender and development with the Just Governance Group, will delve into issues at the intersection of gender and transitional justice. And finally, Nelson Ovalle Diaz, who's a professor of law and an associate of the Human Rights Research and Education Center at the University of Ottawa, will speak to the special jurisdiction and its treatment of exemplary cases based on his extensive publications and ongoing research into these institutions. My colleague, uh, <clears throat> my colleague Kimberly Ingsader, of Executive Director of the Just Governance Group will chair a question and answer session after the uh, three panelists have made their presentations. If you have questions that you'd really like to get into the chat before uh, Q's and A's, feel free to send them in, but they will only be answered once the uh, panelists have finished their presentations and the Q's and A begin. So without further ado, let me pass the virtual mic over to Wade Davis. It's all yours, Wade. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's, it's wonderful to be with you all. And I'll, I'll just quite quickly to give a, a slight overview. I, you know, I think travelers always become enchanted with the first land they encounter that gives them license to be free. And, and for me, it was Colombia, you know, the limitless coastal Caribbean plain, the great reaches of the Cordilleras, the Paramos, the endless Llanos of the Northeast, the Amazon forests, the Pacific Forest, the Choco, all these areas sort of opened up a wider vista to a world that I would spend my lifetime trying to um, understand. And 
this strange kind of love affair between a Canadian boy and a country and a people began innocently enough in 1968 when my mother, a humble Canadian but determined Canadian woman, uh, told me that Spanish was a language of the future. And she worked all year as a secretary in elementary school to raise enough money to allow me to join a small school group uh, being led by a professor to the city of Cali. And I was the youngest of the group at 14. The others were 16 and 17 and the most fortunate because whereas these boys were billeted with wealthy families and spent a sweltering season in the streets of Cali, I was with a more modest family in the mountains above the city. And it was a kind of classic Colombian scene, you know, children too numerous to keep track of, an indulgent father, uh, a grandmother who muttered to herself in the porch overlooking fruit trees and flower beds, uh, an, ang uh, uh, an angelic sister who more than once carried her brother and me home half drunk to a mother kind beyond words who stood by the garden gate tapping her foot on the stone steps as she pretended to be mad. And many of the other lads were suffered from what the Colombians called mamitis or homesickness. And I, who never saw any of them all summer long, I felt quite the opposite. I felt like I'd finally found home. And six years later, I returned in 1974 to Colombia with a one-way ticket, a small backpack of clothes, and just two books, Lawrence's Taxonomy of Vascular Plants and Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. And I believe that bliss was an objective state that you could achieve by simply opening yourself to the world. And both literally and metaphorically, I, I drank from every stream, even from tire tracks on the road. And naturally, I was constantly sick, but that seemed part of the process itself, malarial fevers that rose through the night to break through the dawn. And once on just 24-hour notice, I accepted a commission to guide an eccentric Englishman 250 miles across the swamps and rainforests of the Darien. We got lost for 10 days with no food. It was a horrendous passage in the rainy season when finally I found my way to safety in Panama. I got off a small plane with just a ragged clothes on my back, uh, drenched in vomit for my fellow passengers, $2 to my name, and yet never had I felt more alive. And along the way, I became an acolyte of the great Amazonian explorer, Richard Evan Schultes, who had also found his destiny in Colombia. And when I came to write his biography, a book that was known as One River, it was inevitable that book would be a love letter to a nation by then um, um, scorned by the world. It's interesting, the book El Rio came out in Spanish in 2002, a year that marked a low point in Colombia's fortunes. And at a time when the country's very ability to endure was being called into question, it's curious that a book on botanical exploration uh, would hit such a nerve. But the power of the book lay in the beauty of the translation by the late Nicholas Sesquan. And by the time the third edition came out in 2009, I had a stronger sense of its um, success. By then, the, the nation had really become a pariah in the world. Leading political figures were regularly challenged in the foreign press in a story well known and repeated frequently in the Colombian street, Carolina Barco, the daughter of a revered president, a former external affairs minister, herself at the time, the Colombian ambassador to Washington, D.C., was strip searched at Dulles Airport simply because she had a Colombian passport. And when she complained and presented her diplomatic credentials, the American customs agents uh, barked in obscenity at her as if echoed from the mouth of a dog. And Colombians, most of whom have never used or seen cocaine, one of my closest friends, tells a story when she was a 15-year-old paisa in Medellin, when her family realized that she could not tell the difference between the sound of thunder and the sound of bombs. They sent her to live with Miami with a grandmother. And she was immediately made fun of for being from the city of Escobar by Miami high school students whose main social activity was the pursuit of recreational drugs with Colombian cocaine being the drug of choice. And so for more than 50 years, Colombia has been convulsed by a brutal conflict that left as many as 260,000 dead, 100,000 missing, every single family has suffered. Uh, yet incredibly, in a nation of 50 million, there were never more than 300,000 combatants on all three sides of this fratricidal war. The vast majority of the Colombian people were caught in the vice of war innocent victims 
of a conflict that would not have lasted a day had it not been for the flow of illicit money from the drug trade. At the height of its um, power, the Medellin cartel was shipping 80 tons of cocaine into the United States every month, generating tens of millions of dollars every day. At the height of their influence, the accountants back in Medellin budgeted $1,000 a week simply to buy elastic bands in which to wrap the illicit cash. To estimate the value of the haul, they would bail the $100 bills in hay bales to estimate their value. And critically, without that black money siphoned off, readily spent, the struggle of the leftist guerrillas probably would have fizzled out years ago. And the blood said paracos, the paramilitary forces responsible for 80% of the bloodshed in the war might never have come into being. It's incredible as the peace uh, negotiations began in Havana in the last year before the settlement, the FARC, though down to 6,000 cadre, mostly young children, young men and boy, boys and girls in search of a meal, nevertheless generated $600 million through extortion and drug trafficking. Well, if he gave me the Beverly Hills Boy Scouts and $600 million, I promise you I could wreak havoc in all of Southern California. Colombians, most of whom have never used, let alone seen cocaine, have lived with the trade uh, the consequence of the trade for two generations. In 2000, a kidnapping occurred every three hours of every day. Altogether, at least 30,000 men, women, and children ripped from their homes. By 2012, over 5 million Colombians by either coercion or volition uh, obligation had, had left the country. Within the country, there were 7 million internally displaced. Imagine how differently the United States would feel about its patterns of drug consumption in boards and bar rooms across the country if, as a result of those obsessions in Canada, for example, uh, together with laws that, that created the potential for a black market trade, but sanctions that did nothing to limit that trade, if Canada had those patterns of drug consumption such that 85 million Americans would be forced to flee their homes. Well, that's precisely what happened in Colombia. And cocaine has been Colombia's curse, but the engine driving the train has always been consumption. The, the cartels rose out of the uh, barrios and the country clubs of Cali and Medellin, but ultimate responsibility for Colombia's agonies lies in good measure with every person who has ever used illicit cocaine and any government who has made possible the illicit trade by prohibiting the drug without curbing its use in any serious way. And this continues incidentally until today. But Colombia, of course, is most assuredly not a place of violence and drugs. It is a place of colores y cariño, where the people have endured and overcome these years of conflict precisely because of their character, which I think is informed by an endure enduring spirit of place, a kind of deep love of a land that is most bountiful on the planet, home to the greatest ecological, geographical, and biological diversity on the planet. And it speaks volumes to the character of the Colombian people that through all these years of war, a war largely imposed upon the nation, Colombia, for all of its challenges, has nevertheless managed to maintain civil society, maintain democracy, green its cities, create millions of acres of national parks, and in many ways sought restitution with indigenous people, particularly under the leadership of Virgilio Barco and Martin van Hildebrand with the creation of over 152 resguardos in the Northwest Amazon, an area of land collectively the size of the United Kingdom that was codified in the 1991 constitution as being the land of the indigenous people. No nation state can match that accomplishment. And through all of these terrible years, um, the Colombian people have, been, have managed to, um, to maintain those elements. And today they are posed on the edge of peace and you have two generations of young people uh, who have been forced to leave the country and dwell abroad who are now returning to the country with skill sets in every conceivable endeavor, posing the country on the edge of a potential economic uh, renaissance of tremendous 
uh, significance. But of course, through all of this time, the, the war has, has raged. And in 2002, Alvaro Uribe was elected as a hardliner with Juan Manuel Santos as his defense minister. And in an agreement with the Paracos in 2006, that was by no means a perfect agreement, flawed by, by design, it nevertheless allowed Uribe to take the Paracos off the stage, at least as an open marauding force that didn't eliminate their power, it certainly didn't sanction their activities, but it did remove them from the stage. And then when the agreement came with the FARC, to some extent, I think Santos was obliged to do the same. As President Santos always say, you make peace with your enemies, not with your friends. And so by the same token in Havana, the FARC had to be given an opening to re-enter the society. Neither the Paracos or the leftist forces, the ELN, uh, the FARC and other groups were about to walk out of the forest and simply walk into a jail cell. And, and the, 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 the peace agreement that became uh, so um, controversial um, uh, was, was brought to a referendum on October 2nd. And I remember I was there the evening before the, um, the vote and there was a sense of euphoria within the, the, the country, particularly in Bogota. And then of course, a sense of rejection and dejection the next day when the referendum was narrowly defeated, 50.2% um, to 49.8%, a difference of less than 54,000 votes of the 13 million cast. And of course the vote against the, the referendum for, for peace was cast by those who felt the FARC had got off too easily. But these were the same folks who weren't that concerned when the Paracos got off so easily in 2006. Uh, mercifully, the momentum shifted five days later when President Juan Manuel Santos was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. And this created a new sense of momentum. He hadn't been obliged legally to put the agreement to a national vote. He did that by choice. And of course, in the wake of the defeat of that referendum, he was still legally capable of moving that referendum through the Colombian Congress, which he chose to do. This may have been legal, but it was not politically um, popular. And it, as a consequence of that, there was a tremendous sort of movement um, in a sense against the agreement um, and, the, and the subsequent federal election, whereby Santos, of course, was not constitutionally able to run. And the, 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 the conflict within Colombia split a divided field and allowed um, a protege of Alvaro Uribe, the current president, Duque, to win the office. And so we had, a, I think, a critical point in Colombia's history where had there been the opportunity for somebody who truly believes in the potential of the agreement to have another six years, say, in office, then I think the scenario might be very different. But for better or for worse, Duque ran in part challenging the legitimacy of the agreement. And to be charitable, his administration has been lukewarm to that agreement. Now, the agreement wasn't trivial. The agreement had over four, 578 terms to it. The implementation of it was going to cost $45 billion. Now, this is at a time when Colombia's main source of foreign revenue, oil, collapsed. And at the same time, Colombia was called upon to deal with the greatest humanitarian crisis in the history of Latin America, as 2 million refugees from Venezuela came into Colombia and to the country's enormous credit, and it stands in marked contrast to what was occurring at the Mexican-American border as innocent men, women, and children cast north by the chaos of the very drug trade in question. Chaos originally sown by US foreign policy during the Reagan era that disrupted nation states from Guatemala and Nicaragua to Salvador and Honduras as this 
mass of humanity came north. Children were taken away from families. As recently as October of last fall, there were 525 children in cells on the American side of the border, the whereabouts of their parents being unknown. By contrast, Colombia, in its own moment of need, in the most extraordinary humanitarian gesture, welcomed two million mothers, William, uh, children, and fathers, grandparents. They housed them, they fed them, they looked after them medically, and they sent their kids to school. And to Duque's credit, he only recently gave them legal status to work in the country. I can promise you, whatever side of the political spectrum you fall upon, no nation state in the history of Americas has done such a generous uh, gesture at a moment of its own peril. So part of the problem I think came is that the peace was sudden, unexpected. I remember as recently as 2009, nobody looked forward happily to a peace agreement coming as soon as it did. And of course, as Stephen intimated, at the time of the peace agreement, and this to some extent was the one benefit of the years of conflict that at a time when places like Eastern Ecuador, the Oriente of Ecuador had made choices whereby the extraction of oil, the deforestation, the colonization has transformed Eastern Ecuador. Because of the conflict, much of Colombia remained off limits for industrial development. So the the good news is that Colombia now is posed to be able to make decisions about the fate of its natural landscape, which is the very essence of the national soul of the country, informed by 50 years of understanding of the scientific importance of biodiversity, the importance of the Amazon to, the, to, to, to global climate, that simply was not accessible to the Ecuadorians, for example, when they made those fateful decisions many years ago. But of course, everything hangs in the balance. And I... Mamo, a very close friend of mine from the Arawakos, um, Mamo Camillo, once said to me, you know, la paz no vale nada, si es solamente una manera en que los varios lados pueden unificarse para mantener una guerra contra la naturaleza. Lo que tenemos que, tenemos que hacer paz con todo el mundo. And what he was saying, of course, is that peace won't matter if it's just an excuse to, for the three sides of the conflict to come together to continue to create a war against nature. And so the, 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 everything in a sense hangs in the balance. As peace came to the country, the federal state was not prepared. It didn't have the capacity to move into these areas that were now vacated by the FARC. Into that void moved dissident FARC. Into that void moved members of the various fragmented groups of the original cartels. And these, these elements had no interest in the civil society. They had no interest in the civic leaders lifting their heads to demand the implementation of the peace agreement, all the, all the elements of which were largely about the very social development that the FARC had been calling for for all of those years. So into the void came a, a, an assemblage of individuals who were very happy to begin to shoot and kill civic leaders that emerged. And so I think there was a kind of a perfect storm of disinterest from the new administration, economic pressure from, from, from forces beyond Colombia's control, and a fundamental incapacity to implement in a, in a, in a timely way the conditions of the peace. Uh, I think that had you had uh, Santos, for example, with the prestige of the Nobel Prize in office for even just another couple of years, Colombia could have gone to the world global community and said, you owe us. It's your consumption of cocaine that has led to our, our rivers being the slurries of the shapeless dead. You're the ones, and we, we demand morally your support. And I think Colombia could have gotten that financial support. After all, if the Americans were prepared to spend what they spent on Plan Colombia, why not spend that kind of money for actual peace? And so I think this is why peace is precarious in Colombia. This is why things hang in the balance, but I have tremendous optimism uh, that things will never go back to how they were. You know, when these conflicts, be they in Ireland or South Africa or these fratricidal, uh, uh, um, uh, horrific uh, national spasms of, of, of bloodshed, um, generally what brings them to an end is when the people themselves say bastante, enough. We will not let this happen. And I think Colombia has the 
remarkable capacity, unlike any other country that I know, to overcome the immediate challenges. But again, it all comes down to one thing, cocaine, the venom of the war. As long as we tolerate cocaine, there will never be tranquility and full peace in Colombia. There is one simple solution that we could, with a single stroke of a cleansing pen, is to legalize cocaine, create a nutraceutical market for coca, for the campesinos who are gonna grow coca because nothing else can possibly match its, its, its value. And so why, I ask, should the people of Colombia allow their biodiversity to be put at risk with aerial spraying of poisons that also threaten the well-being of their children just to satisfy the needs of a distant government whose people are under the illusion that they can satisfy their disappointments and loneliness with the use of an anesthetic drug best used to help your dentist pull your teeth. It is time that those who use cocaine should bear the price of using cocaine and countries like Colombia should be freed to market leaves as they've always been known to the Inca, as a divine leaf of immortality, reclaiming the coca plant, a child of Colombia, as a symbol of patrimony, a point of pride, one of the most incredible medicinal and healing plants known to botanists around the world. So I think that is the great hope, the power and the spirit of the Colombian people. And it's to that that I've chosen to dedicate most of my efforts and my my last years of my professional life. Thank you very much, Wade, for that panoramic overview of Colombia's recent history of wars, of connections with the drug trade, of course, but also of the counterpoints, color y cariño, and biodiversity and its protection, and so on, and, and of uh, situating the peace processes in that extremely complex uh, Colombian context. Uh, and uh, reminding us of setting the stage to help us understand uh, both the promise, the opportunities uh, offered by the peace process, but also the controversies it has uh, generated and the immense challenges faced by not only the state, the current government uh, of President Duque, but by other stakeholders in trying to, uh, to realize this, this potential. So we'll now take this to a different level by passing the, uh, the virtual mic and the screen to Paula Jimenez, uh, who will, uh, in a sense, take us to a more uh, local level uh, view uh, from uh, uh, women's organizations and other activists and their more bottom-up uh, perspective, if you will, on, on the current uh, crisis. Paula, it's all yours. So uh, just to, sorry, I should say that Paula, I may be presenting in Spanish, uh, but uh, her slides will be in English. So for those who are not uh, fluent in Spanish, uh, there's a lot of information on the slides. So follow along with us and then we'll have a multilingual dialogue at the end. Okay, thank you. So um, good afternoon to all. My name is Paula Jimenez and uh, today I'm going to be talking about collective reparations from a gender perspective. I want to thank you for inviting me to join this panel, but unfortunately my English is not good enough, so I'm going to speak in Spanish. Entonces, eh, la presentación tiene tres grandes eh, partes, tres, tres, eh, tres grandes bloques. En el primero, siguiente, por favor, en el primero vamos a revisar un poco las características generales de este programa de reparación colectiva. En segundo lugar, vamos a revisar algunos aspectos que de alguna manera ayudan a entender la dimensión de los retos que tiene el Estado colombiano para lograr una reparación realmente eh, eh, transformadora desde el punto de vista de la igualdad de género. Y en el tercer punto voy a presentarles algunas de las críticas o de los puntos críticos que las organizaciones de mujeres han identificado en estos eh, eh, procesos de reparación colectiva. Entonces, eh, para empezar, eh, decirles que eh, la reparación colectiva en Colombia tiene su primer origen en, la, en el proceso de negociación del, del gobierno Álvaro Uribe Vélez con eh, las Autodefensas Unidas de Colombia. Ese proceso tuvo, digamos, un soporte legal que fue eh, la Ley de Justicia y Paz, conocida como la Ley de Justicia y Paz de, del año 2005, y en esta ley fue la primera definición que se le hizo a la reparación colectiva. Esta definición se fue enriqueciendo, siguiente, 
y eh, eh, pues es, se configuró lo que tenemos hoy como reparación colectiva en Colombia, que es básicamente un programa del nivel nacional, que es ejecutado por una instancia nacional a partir de una ley que sale en el año 2011, que es la ley de víctimas y básicamente pues es una, eh, una serie de medidas que se orientan a resarcir los daños que sufrieron las organizaciones, colectivos sociales y políticos y las comunidades en el marco del conflicto armado. Entonces, desde el 2011 eh, 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 se creó digamos, esta figura de, del Programa Nacional de Reparación Colectiva y a partir de ahí pues ha habido algunas eh, reglamentaciones posteriores de la ley eh, que tienen que ver mucho, y como lo vamos a ver más adelante, con el, eh, eh, la creación de una ruta étnica específica tanto para pueblos indígenas como para eh, pueblos afrocolombianos. Ahora sí, siguiente. Um, para imaginarnos un poco qué es un plan de, de reparación colectiva, hay como tres grandes dimensiones o tipos de medidas que tiene un plan de reparación. Una son las materiales como tal, que son los bienes y servicios que se destinan digamos, a, a reparar el daño de reconstrucción de infraestructura de las organizaciones, reconstrucción de infraestructura comunitaria. Hay otra dimensión que es la dimensión simbólica, que no se trata de reparar lo que se perdió, sino reparar lo que eso significaba para las organizaciones. Eso implica, digamos, un proceso de eh, reflexión de ellas para poder entender qué fue lo que pasó y simbolizarlo. Y también está eh, una dimensión política, un tipo de medidas políticas en las que básicamente se busca eh, que el Estado garantice la existencia de estos, de estos grupos y asociaciones políticas y, y sociales. Siguiente, por favor. En cuanto a los enfoques eh, eh, principales, hay dos enfoques que son fundamentales, que son el enfoque eh, diferencial y el enfoque transformador, pero esos los voy a, 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 a abordar en la siguiente parte. Siguiente. En cuanto... A los avances del proceso, básicamente lo que es muestran las cifras, y aquí voy a citar eh, el informe que hicieron los órganos de control en Colombia eh, eh, al Congreso de la República sobre el avance del programa, pues digamos los avances no han sido los esperados. Eh, eh, hoy en Colombia se reconocen 755 eh, sujetos de reparación colectiva, eh, y de esos, el 71% están en las primeras fases del proceso, que son eh, diagnóstico del daño y demás, y apenas el 29% han logrado llegar al diseño e implementación de los planes de reparación colectiva. Eh, según ese informe, solamente 16 sujetos colectivos han terminado su proceso de reparación colectiva. Siguiente. En términos de eh, ejemplos, eh, pues hay cuatro grandes tipos de, 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 de actores o de sujetos eh, eh, de estas reparaciones colectivas. Yo aquí en, el, en la slide puse cuatro ejemplos que tal vez podríamos eh, profundizar a través de las preguntas, porque el tiempo no, no me permite profundizar, pero básicamente son cuatro tipos. Uno, los eh, sujetos a nivel nacional, que aquí encontramos periodistas, sindicalistas, diputados, concejales, eh, partidos políticos, eh, organizaciones de derechos humanos que eh, han sido reconocidas dentro de un proceso a nivel nacional. Hay otro tipo de actores que son más a nivel territorial y que, en el que se ha pretendido, digamos, reparar a comunidades y eso se ha expresado en que corregimientos, inclusive municipios completos, por, eh, son reconocidos como sujetos de reparación colectiva. Y desde el punto de vista diferencial también hay organizaciones de mujeres eh, eh, que, están siendo, que están pasando por este proceso y eh, comunidades indígenas. Siguiente. Entonces, un poco para ver estos aspectos generales que de alguna manera muestran la dimensión del reto que tiene Colombia en ese sentido, eh, el primero tiene que ver con dos categorías que son muy importantes para entender cuál es la condición jurídica y política de las mujeres en el contexto de la justicia transicional. Esas son dos categorías que son absolutamente interdependientes, que no pueden ser escindidas y que han venido, digamos, construyendo y consolidando con el tiempo. Eso tiene mucho que ver con el hecho de que la justicia transicional en Colombia esté parada o, o que esté fundamentada en dos procesos de paz o en dos procesos de negociación que fueron totalmente disímiles en muchos, eh, de muchas maneras, pero específicamente desde el punto de vista de la igualdad de género. Pasamos de un proceso de negociación con la SACL, que el tema de género fue precario, existe, a un proceso de eh, negociación con las FARC y un, y un acuerdo de paz que es paradigmático en términos de género en muchos sentidos. La creación de misión de género en la que fueron representantes del gobierno, representantes de las guerrillas, eh, un número muy importante de medidas afirmativas dentro del acuerdo, 
una, eh, una, eh, eh, una serie de, de, de medidas dentro del acuerdo que están siendo seguidas a través de 51 indicadores. O sea, digamos, pasamos de un acuerdo muy tímido a un acuerdo muy, muy paradigmático. Y esto último se logró gracias a que las mujeres estuvieron ahí eh, eh, haciendo la incidencia para participar directamente y para que los temas de género quedaran ahí en el acuerdo. Y de alguna manera, pues, hay, eh, 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 es en esa evolución que llegamos a estas dos categorías que son tan importantes. Una, la de las mujeres como víctimas, pero también sujetos, perdón, como víctimas y sujetos de especial protección, pero también las mujeres como agentes políticos, que incluso fueron victimizadas por ese ejercicio de activismo social, político, humanitario, y que hoy es indudable que tienen un papel fundamental en la construcción de una paz estable y duradera. Estas son las dos dimensiones desde las cuales las mujeres hacen las críticas y abordan los temas de justicia transicional. Siguiente. Un segundo aspecto importante es que en Colombia eh, ha habido un jurídicamente, no necesariamente institucionalmente ni en la apoyación de los programas, pero jurídicamente sí existe un marco eh, muy robusto en términos de incorporar el enfoque de género y, el, y incorporar un enfoque étnico. Eh, no voy a entrar, digamos, en las, en, las, en las fuentes de cómo esto se fue configurando, eh, pero digamos, eh, 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 hay un proceso que tiene un momento importante en el acuerdo con las, con las FARC, porque este acuerdo demanda que haya un fortalecimiento de las reparaciones colectivas, pero básicamente, digamos, en Colombia hoy jurídicamente está claro cuáles han sido las violaciones específicas que han sufrido las mujeres, los pueblos indígenas y los pueblos afro en el marco del conflicto armado y unos estándares generales que deberían guiar el proceso sobre cómo repararlos. Y creo que eso es algo muy particular, eh, eh, no necesariamente algo que se está eh, viendo operativizado, pero que sí existe en, en términos de, de referentes. Yo no, por el tiempo no los voy a poder abordar, simplemente si nos podemos devolver al primero, Ah, este, perfecto. Simplemente voy a hacer referencia a uno de ellos, el resto los van a tener ustedes ahí en el PowerPoint. Y es cómo estos estándares legales, etcétera, llaman a que debe haber una coordinación entre eh, eh, el Estado colombiano y las autoridades indígenas, pero que eso no puede obstar para la participación de las mujeres. Se establece que se debe reconocer aspectos o fenómenos como la subordinación de las mujeres respetando al gobierno propio, respetando a las autoridades propias, pero que debe haber como un reconocimiento en ese sentido. Y así como este, pues hay otros estándares que son muy importantes, pero que básicamente hacen eso, que el marco jurídico en términos de incorporación del enfoque de género y étnico sea bastante robusto, tanto para reparación colectiva como para otras figuras de justicia transicional. Y el tercer aspecto tiene que ver con el profundo vínculo que genera eh, la siguiente, por favor. Que, genera, que se genera entre la agenda, la siguiente, entre la agenda de derechos humanos, justicia transicional, víctimas, con la agenda de género y desarrollo. Para entender que existe una eh, reparación realmente transformadora desde el punto de vista de, de género, hay que eh, eh, reconocer al menos cuatro elementos. Uno, que se reconozcan las condiciones previas de desigualdad, violencia y subordinación de género que, que eran anteriores al hecho victimizante. Segundo, reconocer que esas o cómo esas condiciones previas determinan las afectaciones que viven las personas por el conflicto, identificar las afectaciones diferenciales y definir medidas que realmente reparen el daño, pero además contribuyan a transformar esos aspectos estructurales. Entonces, de estos cuatro puntos de vista es que han empezado a aparecer medidas dentro de los planes de reparación colectiva a organizaciones de mujeres que hablan, por ejemplo, del tema de acceso a la tierra, del restablecimiento de proyectos colectivos, del de problema de autonomía económica de las mujeres, el tema de la distribución de las tareas de cuidado y demás, que si ustedes se dan cuenta son muy propias de la agenda de género y desarrollo. ¿Mm? Y entonces aquí entran a jugar en el escenario, pues, los retrasos y las dificultades que ha tenido también el Estado colombiano para avanzar en esa agenda de género y desarrollo, los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y específicamente lo de C5. Y creo que eso también, digamos, complejiza bastante ese escenario en que realmente el Estado colombiano pueda lograr una reparación eh, transformadora. Esos serían como los tres elementos muy en general. Siguiente, siguiente y siguiente. 
Esta tercera parte eh, la quisiera dedicar a contarles a ustedes cuáles son las críticas o los puntos críticos que las organizaciones de mujeres han venido eh, identificando en los programas de reparación colectiva. Entonces, para eso elaboré algunas frases que no son textuales, no, no estoy citando a nadie, pero sí tratan como un poco de recoger las ideas que las mujeres han expresado en varios informes. Eh, varios, eh, varios de informes, eh, esos informes están al final de la presentación, les pueden hacer clic para ir a los informes. Yo, yo lo que hice fue como resaltar algunas frases para mostrarles qué es lo que las mujeres piensan y reclaman frente a este contexto de reparaciones colectivas. Y para eso pues voy a utilizar un, 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 un de categorías muy básico que, es, que, ha venido, que han venido utilizando las organizaciones de mujeres que le están haciendo el seguimiento con enfoque de género al proceso de paz con las FARC. Eh, hablamos de distribución económica o redistribución económica y es que tanto en estos programas es, y cómo se están asumiendo las desigualdades eh, eh, previas como las veíamos hace un momento en términos económicos, sociales y demás. Eh, el reconocimiento cultural que tiene que ver mucho con todos estos patrones, estereotipos que ponen a la mujer en un lugar subordinado o, o, o de una, en desventaja eh, ponen a lo femenino. Y tercero, pues la participación política, que tanto en estos procesos se está logrando una participación eh, eh, de las mujeres en pie de igualdad. Entonces, frente a eso, como les digo, lo que hice fue agrupar algunas frases que me parece que pueden, espero que puedan ser vicientes respecto de lo que dicen las mujeres. Las voy a leer. Eh, eh. Entonces, la primera frase es, a las mujeres nos das más poquito porque piensan que no vamos a pedir tanto. La segunda frase. La segunda frase. A mi mamá le gustaba mucho la cría de pollos y preparar alimentos. A nosotras no. Quisiéramos producir cacao que sí deja plata. Tercera frase. Yo no tuve tiempo para ir a las reuniones a explicarles que yo nunca tengo tiempo. Cuarto. Construimos nuestro plan de reparación colectiva, pero no se está respetando los acuerdos y los tiempos. Quinto, me alegra que nos, que nos hayan dado ingreso preferencial a la universidad. Qué lástima que yo igual no cumplo con los requisitos. Sexto, pero no se supone que igual el Estado colombiano tenía que construirnos ese acueducto. Séptimo, somos expertas en hacer diagnóstico de daños, acompañamiento psicosocial. Sin embargo, contrataron a un tercero para hacer ese trabajo por nosotros. Entonces, en este grupo básicamente vemos que las mujeres hacen críticas desde, un desde lo que se ve como el posicionamiento subordinado de las mujeres en las dinámicas locales de desarrollo. También hablan sobre la sobrecarga de trabajo, de cuidado que les impide participar en estos espacios. También hablan cómo se crean medidas afirmativas pero estas med para el colectivo, pero estas medidas afirmativas no tienen en cuenta las necesidades de las mujeres. Eh, el segundo grupo eh, de, de, de frases tienen que ver con este reconocimiento cultural y que yo parafraseo de la siguiente manera, eh, como dirían las mujeres en este caso. Eh, primera frase, nos dimos cuenta que éramos víctimas después que terminaron los actos de reparación. Segundo, nos ha parecido muy bueno el centro de salud que construyeron en el municipio, pero todavía yo no entendí por qué fui víctima de violencia sexual. Tres, disculpe, no hablo español. Cuatro, sí fuimos, pero se nos fue el tiempo de repartir los refrigerios y hacer las actas de las reuniones. Quinto, muchas personas sabían lo que me pasó a mí y a muchas otras, pero de eso nunca se habló. Tal vez es porque se trata de un asunto que solo nos afectó a cada una de nosotros. Sexto, me hubiera gustado hablar del daño que nos han hecho la presencia de actores armados en nuestro territorio y la pérdida de nuestra cultura. Nunca me preguntaron sobre eso. Y séptimo, todavía hay quien justifica lo que nos pasó por estar haciendo cosas que no nos corresponden, cosas de otras. Y finalmente, en el grupo de puntos críticos de participación, voy a leer muy rápidamente este, las frases que un poco que muestran los déficits que hay en participación de las mujeres desde el punto de vista cuantitativo y cualitativo. Primera frase, no sabíamos que podíamos ir y tampoco nos invitaron. Segunda frase, fuimos, pero nos, no nos sentimos en confianza de hablar de nuestros temas y preocupaciones. Tercero, fuimos, pero fuimos una inmensa minoría. Cuarto, nos invitan a tantos espacios que ya no entendemos muy bien en qué estamos participando. Quinto, cuando hablamos de nuestros derechos, como los funcionarios públicos no saben de qué estamos hablando o no quieren saber. 
Sexto, logramos estar, pero tuvimos que, que pelear por ello. Séptimo, le apostamos al acuerdo final de paz, pero no queremos poner en riesgo nuestras dinámicas organizativas. Octavo, a veces nos parece que le estamos dedicando más tiempo a las reuniones de plan de reparación colectiva que a nuestros propios objetivos como organización. Y noveno, están convocando a gente que no nos representa. Entonces, para terminar muy rápidamente, eh, cinco ideas fuerza de esta presentación. Eh, el primero es que Colombia tiene un marco institucional eh, jurídico, más que institucional, un marco jurídico innovador, fuerte para los temas de eh, 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 incorporar el tema de género y, y étnico. Segundo, que eh, ya en la operación, esto, el programa está enfrentando, digamos, de, de retos importantes. Eh, tercero, muy importante, que hay un movimiento social de mujeres fuerte, maduro, con capacidad de hacer propuestas técnicas, hacerle seguimiento, eh, y que eh, es importante también hacer este vínculo entre la agenda de justicia transicional y derechos humanos con la agenda de género y desarrollo. Muchas gracias y perdón si me pasé un poco del tiempo. Thank you very much, Paula, uh, for this fascinating uh, comparison of the 2005 Accords uh, and the Law on Reparations uh, and compared to the 2016 Accords and the Framework for Collective Reparations and the different gender dimensions of both, uh, both uh, legal frameworks, if you will. Uh, uh, you, your comments on how uh, particularly with the 2016 Accord, there being significant uh, juridical advances with regards to uh, incorporating women as less as victims or not just as victims and uh, equally as agents of uh, change uh, is, uh, is, is quite important, it's very uh, notable. Uh, thanks so much for the rich testimonies uh, from a diversity of women in very different communities that uh, indicate also how difficult it is to realize uh, this potential that exists on paper, that is recognized on paper, the potent difficulty in, in practice. So we'll come back to that, I'm sure, to those tensions uh, uh, throughout the Q's and A's, uh, but I'd like to pass it on to uh, Professor uh, Nelson uh, or Valle Diaz to now take us a little bit deeper into the workings of the special jurisdiction, which is another uh, innovation uh, of the 2016 Accords that has its roots in the 2005 Accord, of course, but uh, uh, has been taken to a, a new level. And I think there too, we'll find this tension between what is uh, the potential uh, unleashed by the Accords or opened up and then the extreme uh, and enormous difficulties to actually putting, putting that potential into practice. So Nelson, uh, last but not least, it's yours. Thank you very much, Stefan, and all the participants to this panel. I am very happy to present uh, today the special jurisdiction of peace in Colombia and his treatment of exemplary cases. Uh, I uh, want to make the link between the special jurisdiction of peace in Colombia and the model of transitional uh, uh, justice. Uh, that is the main uh, issue here, there's a theoretical uh, perspective. Uh, the special jurisdiction of Colombia is a transitional justice model that is complemented with a truth commission uh, that is working uh, beside the special jurisdiction of peace. And uh, what is transitional justice? Transitional justice is a, a judicial and non judicial mechanism that uh, may criminal law apply to those responsible for international crime, more flexible to put end to internal uh, armed conflict. That is the idea. And there are four elements in transitional justice uh, transformation of society. Uh, toward peace and democracy, flexibility of criminal law, temporary uh, application of special rules, and a wider scope of political actions uh, after a peace agreement. And uh, the transitional justice model apply uh, as a implementation as a, uh, of peace agreement. Uh, that is the uh, situation in the case of Colombia after uh, 
2016. Uh, if we uh, take in consideration uh, the uh, uh, transitional justice, the first element is transformation. Transformation uh, is the idea that the peace agreement will transform a society uh, more democratic, more inclusive, and other elements. And in this case, we had only get one uh, important in, uh, outcome after the peace agreement was the uh, outcome that the first EP um, get out the arms to the delegation of the Security Council. That means the uh, former FAR EP are now a political uh, inst uh, organization and no more a, a army group, unless for the majority of them that they accept to become a, a member of the civil society. But the other elements of the transformation are not yet uh, in place uh, after the peace agreement. The second element of transitional justice, uh, that is the model of the special jurisdiction of peace in Colombia, is the flexibility. The idea that the uh, criminal code and the uh, other uh, rules of criminal law doesn't apply to the members of army group that participate in the conflict and is in a state of the criminal code and other uh, regular uh, rule, uh, the participants in the conflict will get a more flexible uh, system of law than allow them uh, to accept the deal, to accept to uh, give out the uh, weapons and become a civil citizens. And that is uh, one of the elements that is common in transitional justice and is common in the special jurisdiction of peace in Colombia. The other element is the temporary measures. That means in a transitional justice, as is the case of Colombia, is no permanent system, it's only a, a provisional system. The special, the special jurisdiction of peace is a, has a provisional uh, duration, uh, 10 years to start the investigation procedures, five additional years to complete judgments and the possibility of uh, uh, five years more. At the end, maximum 20 years could be uh, the possibility of duration of, for the special jurisdiction of peace. Uh, in the case of uh, Truth Commission, has only three years mandate, which finished this November 2021. The uh, Truth Commission are working very hard right now uh, because it's not easy taking in consideration the restrictions uh, 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 because COVID-19 uh, and they are uh, doing uh, these uh, virtual meetings with victims, with many people. Uh, we, are, we are working right now uh, here. They are working by themselves, trying to uh, understand uh, the, um, uh, how the conflict happens and they use a territorial model. That means they uh, divide the country in 26 regions and try to understand in which region what happened in each uh, area of Colombia where uh, the conflict was uh, more uh, stronger at the, uh, at the time. The last element of transitional justice is wider scope. That means uh, the uh, special jurisdiction of peace uh, has a, a integrate a, a very wider uh, system of justice that is not only justice, it's more than justice, is the idea of reparation, no repetition, and try uh, to uh, uh, have uh, the mandate uh, uh, with the uh, truth commission to uh, uh, reconstruct the, um, uh, the social uh, body yeah, and in order to make uh, a real uh, new uh, becoming for the member of the society, doesn't matter if they before was uh, uh, opposed in opposite side after the peace agreement. The idea is that the, this uh, uh, transitional justice allowed them to become together again. Uh, that is, uh, in general, the presentation about the theoretical approach. Now we are necessary to go to the numbers. What are happening in reality? with the special jurisdiction of peace. They are uh, some numbers. Uh, and um, for example, we had uh, that the majority of people uh, uh, 
who are submitted to the uh, special jurisdiction of peace are members of the FAR, former FAR. We had 9,747 as members of FAR uh, who are now submitted to the jurisdiction of uh, the uh, special jurisdiction of peace. They represent 76.5% uh, of the uh, people submitted to the, this jurisdiction. The second group are the public force, that means the members of the army, the member of the National Police of Colombia. We had 2,900 members of the state forces that represent 22.3% that are submitted to the special jurisdiction of peace. And we had the third uh, group of people are stage agents. That means public servants. That is the idea. They are no member of the military, uh, but they are member of the, uh, of the public authorities. And they are uh, 134 members of the representative of the state that are now submitted to the special jurisdiction of peace. And we had the lower, uh, smaller group is the social protesters. That is a special uh, circumstances because the, during the conflict, uh, and it uh, still happen now, they are the phenomenon of criminalization of protesters. And some protesters are taking this way uh, to uh, avoid uh, the uh, ordinary jurisdiction and take the uh, special jurisdiction of peace in order to clean the uh, situation and say, and this protester happened uh, in the context of the army conflict. And this is a small group, only uh, 12 people and represent only 0.1% uh, of the cases. The idea here, is that they are almost uh, or more than um, 12,000 uh, uh, people that are submitted, 12,843 people submitted to the special jurisdiction of peace. This is a, a very huge number. It's not possible to proceed with uh, 12,843 people in an individual uh, process. That means it's necessary to uh, use the micro process uh, model. That means the special jurisdiction of peace are not um, investigating one by one, are investigating by micro cases. In the micro cases, uh, the special jurisdiction of peace organized uh, until now seven macro cases, and there are other cases that are not in this list, are uh, beside this list, but they are seven micro cases, that means the special jurisdiction of peace tried to put this uh, uh, 12,000 uh, people submitted to the jurisdiction in a specific micro case, uh, cases, but they are another element that we need to understand that is that uh, they are <clears throat> some uh, members uh, of the jurisdiction, special jurisdiction of peace uh, give a some a member of our, the amnesty uh, auction when the as member are were, were in the lower level of the organization and only the higher uh, member of as far are uh, submitted uh, for the full process in the special jurisdiction of peace and they must to uh, be uh, uh, before the uh, accusations for the uh, high criminality in this case uh, we had a uh, uh, the special jurisdiction of peace select seven macro cases in that is in order to represent the bigger uh, 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 international crimes and they are the case number one is of stash taking and other serious uh, deprivation of liberty committed by the FARC. This first case is only target the FARC of as far members and uh, but uh, that is a specific case but they are a case target a specific agent of the state is the case number 03. Death illegitimately presented as a combat casualties by the state agents. That means uh, we have two um, uh, big cases, the case one and the case three. The case one is uh, target a specific the FARC members and the higher commanders of the FARC and the case three are targeted the members of the army and the other uh, representative of the state 
then they kill uh, illegitimately a, some people presented as a, a combative causality, but was not the case in the Spanish languages we say uh, falsos positivos. It, the case number three is the case of falsos positivos. And they are maybe the more uh, important cases uh, that are happening until now. Uh, they are other cases that take a uh, regional uh, approach. Is for example, the case number two, prioritize the territorial situation in Ricaurte, Tumaco, and Barbacoas, Nariño, is in the uh, border with Ecuador area. That is a territorial case. They are at other territorial case, the case number four, the territorial situation in Urabá region is the region where uh, they are the growing of banana, uh, banana production and other uh, uh, agricultural pro products that are very uh, important in the region. And is a, a case, a territorial case. The case number five is the same situation. Prioritize the territorial situation in the northern region of Cauca and Southern Valley of the Cauca. This is a particular region where they are a combination of many ethnic groups, uh, African, Colombian, Aboriginal people, and in conflict with uh, sugar cane producers and other uh, social issues that are very deep in Colombia uh, history and uh, still going. And in this area, uh, the conflict is still, uh, still uh, happen today. For example, uh, we had uh, uh, the situations in the last days in the Cauca region that is uh, is not uh, not yet in peace. The case uh, uh, number six is victimization, victimization of member of the Patriot Union. Patriot Union was a, a political party that was uh, um, disappeared by the state agents, and they are. Uh, mm, more than 8,000 members of this uh, political party that are affected, and it's a, a specific case. And this same case is now before the Inter-American Court of uh, Human Rights. That means we had the same case, the case of Patriot Union, now in the special jurisdiction of peace uh, regarding the um, uh, implementation of the peace agreement. But the same case is now before the Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights and uh, the, uh, maybe the outcome could be, could be uh, similar. And the last case is recruitment and use of guilt and voice in the army conflict. This is uh, the last macro case. I don't have the time to explain the details of this case. However, I will only um, uh, talk a little about three cases. The case uh, targeting the FARC uh, leaders because they are uh, 51 uh, suspect uh, high uh, level as far members that are targeting by the case of hostage taking and other serious uh, deprivation of liberty committee by the far uh, in general they are 21396 victims of this uh, kind of crime committed by the uh, former members of the far and we have the first indictment. Uh, the, until now, the special jurisdiction of peace has uh, adopted only one indictment. Uh, three years later, it's uh, a little uh, slow, but if we compare with the International Criminal Court, uh, it's like the same uh, speed. It's not, it's not too fast, it's not uh, too uh, slow. If we compare to the international standards, if we compare with the Rwanda Tribunal or Yugoslavia Tribunal, uh, adopt the field indictment three years late is in the uh, average of international uh, in transitional uh, justice system. It's, it's not, for some people it's too uh, slow, but for a spare working in the file, this is the average uh, to uh, um, adopt the fish indictment. And we believe that there are other indictments coming in the other cases. The case that is very controversial in Colombia is the number three, death illegitimately presented as a combat uh, casualty by the state agents, because it's the case of, in Colombia, all people know falsos positivos. And uh, the main issue is uh, because we had 6,402 victims. That means people who were killed, but was not 
uh, combatants, what civil civil people, but even uh, being civil people, the army forces present them as a uh, combatants, and that was not true, and that is a very huge uh, crime because six thousand is the double of number that Pinochet forces killed in the Pino, uh, Pinochet uh, time, Pino, in the Pinochet in Chile. Um, the Pinochet killed more than 3,000 people at the time, but in the uh, Colombia army conflict, the uh, army of Colombia killed more than 6,000. That is higher number than the case of the Chile. That is a controversial case, and they are 352 members of the army uh, now submitted to the special jurisdiction of peace. They are other members of the army that are not here, but uh, that is uh, the number until now. And uh, because my time is running, I want to go to the last case, recruitment and use of gear and boys in the army conflict. Uh, this is a particular case. These numbers are not, uh, Exactly, we had seven, 17,024 uh, mm, uh, number of victimizing events. That means situations where the um, uh, groups recruit girls and boys. But my uh, concern is that this situation is still happening right now. Even after the peace agreement, the dissident of FAR and other army groups groups uh, still recruiting uh, girls and boys uh, in order to incorporate them in army groups. And that uh, allowed me to go uh, to the conclusions. As a conclusion, uh, uh, this, uh, I don't have the time to explain deep why this is the conclusion, but I had uh, Colombian survivors are getting more truth in state of justice. That is my first uh, lecture of the implementation of the special jurisdiction of peace in Colombia. We know more now than before of the peace agreement. The citizens know a lot of what happened, things that they were not able to know before. That was the more important contribution until now of the special jurisdiction of peace and the contribution of the truth commission, because we had more truth. But, none is, but we don't have necessary justice until now. However, a stable peace is far to begin. That is the other problem, because uh, in many, uh, many regions in Colombia, the peace arrived for a very short time. But in reality now, uh, for example, Argelia, Cauca today, they are in trouble, in big trouble, because this internal army conflict. The main cause of the conflict inequity is still growing even after the 2016 peace agreement between uh, their uh, data coming from the uh, statistic uh, of Colombia, DANE, uh, that show that the uh, inequity is still growing even after the peace agreement and before COVID. Uh, and because COVID, we had a new situation. The pandemic of COVID-19 is a new challenge that Headline the inequality as the main problem of Colombians. That is, uh, this problem of inequality is coming before COVID, and now with COVID, it's only more uh, evident that they are a huge problem about inequality in Colombia. Colombia is between the 10, in the top 10 countries more with more inequality problems. If we take the Gini uh, coefficient, uh, we can uh, understand the level of inequality in Colombia. And now the COVID is uh, increasing this uh, inequality uh, situation. That means that the main concern for new violence in Colombia is the lack of opportunities for the new generation. Very important. One out of three jobs in Colombia does uh, not have any job or a study opportunity. And the criminal organization are ready to recruit them. And that I made the link with the case number seven. Uh, the case number seven is recruitment of youth and girls and boys in the army conflict. And we, as we say in the theoretical uh, first part, uh, one of the uh, goals of transitional justice is no repetition. 
uh, no repetition, but uh, we had that that is not happening because now the uh, criminal organization is still recruiting uh, girls and boys in order to uh, incorporate them in army groups. And that is happening right now. And the Colombia army are targeting these uh, uh, groups and they are killing uh, children. In the, the army of Colombia are killing children that the uh, our, uh, army groups uh, recruit. That means uh, for them, the conflict is not over. For them, the conflict is still uh, as uh, before the peace agreement. Thank you very much. And I hope uh, to uh, go deeper in the question period. Thank you very much, Nelson, for this uh, rigorous overview of the special jurisdiction and how it complements the Truth Commission. Thanks for taking us through the uh, overall docket of cases uh, that are being considered by the special jurisdiction and then bringing us down to actually look at uh, a few of those exemplary cases and what conflict dynamics they've been tied to. And thanks finally for your closing thoughts on this uh, paradox of uh, there being more truth than justice certainly so far uh, in, 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 uh, through the, uh, these mechanisms. And, uh, and leaving us with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the big challenge of uh, ongoing social in grave social and economic inequalities, in fact, driving a resurgence or a perpetuation of violence. Uh, so this, this ties into some of the questions that have been posed in the chat. Uh, and so with this, I will turn the microphone over to my colleague, uh, 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 Kimberly Inksader of the Just Governance Group to moderate the Q&A session. Over to you, Kim. Thank you very much, Stephen. And thank you, Wade and Paola and Nelson, all very interesting um, quest or presentations. And they've uh, um, triggered some interesting questions too that we can follow up on. We have um, maybe not quite as much time as we'd hope for questions, but I wanted to, um, ask Wade if he could respond to one. And it's from a Carleton professor who um, studies conflict. And he was questioning whether cocaine is like a driving force, a root cause, and that is that the focus that we need to have or are there more structural um, factors in the political system, economic, et cetera, that even predate the, the introduction of cocaine and drug trafficking as, a, as an aggravating factor. Well, I, I think you wanted uh, to respond to that. Sure. I mean, I, first of all, I wanted to thank Nelson and Paola. I, I love their presentations. Uh, I, I think the most powerful statistic that we've heard today is what Nelson just said. Uh, um, 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 that that thirty percent of young people have neither study opportunities nor employment opportunities. So obviously, to the question from the professor from Carleton, um, it, uh, by no means am I suggesting that cocaine is the the sole problem of uh, instability within Colombia. Obviously, a country that ranks in the top ten in terms of overall inequity. Remember that, of course, Bolivia, for example, had fundamental land reform in nineteen fifty two. Peru in 1965, for better or for worse. And, and Colombia has never really had a sustained sort of system, a process of land reform. And the inequities that, that Nelson spoke about um, uh, really go hand in hand with the, the, the conundrum of the cocaine trade. Um, you, know, you know, when you have young people who are unemployed with few opportunities, um, the, the, the attraction of any illicit uh, criminal activity becomes all that is the only the only game in town, if you will. I think that the point of the co of focusing on the cocaine is that it's difficult, I think, for people outside of the world of Colombia to, to see the extent of the damage of that trade, the scale of it, the the uh, the the, um, the the overwhelming uh, consequences of that uh, trade. I mean, I think it's really quite clear that the the fuel of the fire of war that has maintained the conflict for 50 years. I mean, obviously, long before there was a there was a, a struggle with cocaine in, in, in a major commercial uh, illicit sense. I mean, Colombia went through La Violencia. I mean, Colombia went through the War of a Thousand 
days. I mean, Colombia, since the time of independence, has been a, a nation. Um, you know, in a way, if geography is destiny, one of the challenges of Colombia has always been the weakness of the federal state in good measure because of the complexity of the topographical landscape of, of Colombia, arguably the most geographically challenging place on earth. And it, it, that, that gave rise to local power structures, uh, often at the head of which were individuals who were quite prepared to exploit the reciprocity of hatred that goes right back to the time of the conflict between Bolivar and Santander, in which you, you had coming out of the revolution or even before the revolution, you know, you had a, a kind of a one side of the revolution inspired by dreams of the enlightenment and another side um, of established gentry whose main goal was simply to replace the Spaniards with themselves at the head of an oligarchy dominated by the influence of the church. And so those two halves of the Colombian reality go deep in the history of the country. Uh, a, a more progressive uh, party hue with a hue of red and, and a, a more resistant um, or a conventional party the blue side of things. And so obviously there's been this tension. I mean, the, the number of conflicts that raised throughout the 19th century, uh, uh, some of them almost laughable in their origins had not the consequences been so, so desperate, including the uh, War of a Thousand Days. But the, the, co the presence of the cocaine money, uh, without doubt, added a level of intensity and violence that simply um, would not have been there without the cocaine. Uh, so I can I, I, can I um, ask you to maybe respond to a linked question and then I'm going to go to Paula hmm. and, and Nelson with some particular questions. Another um, attendee asked if the if, um, 2016 Accord is dealing with some of the, the regional um, discrepancies and in the inequalities that you mentioned and that Nelson. Well, I think Nelson to. and Paula would more. I, I, one, one thing I just really liked about what Paula said is that, again, my experience is I'm a storyteller, I'm a writer, I just traveled through the region. But, but the one consistent thing I saw was that the strength and promise of peace lay with the women. And Paula, I have to get you a copy of my new book, Magdalena, Historias de Colombia, when it comes out in Spanish with Planeta, because I profile uh, two women, uh, uh, one in um, uh, Puerto Triunfo and another in uh, La Dorado, who came from San Diego, women who may be known to you, and, and the strength of these women, uh, and what they endured, and the hope of Colombia lies in the women, I absolutely believe that. Um, um, uh, and Kimberly, what was he? I'm getting too old. No, well, someone asked because I asked if oh, the 2016 oh, yes. no, I know. I, yeah. Accord. No, what you were saying. I'm, I'm again. You know, you know. One of the things that I find wonderful to be with Nelson and Paula is that you know I can give you this overview of the nation from the uh, almost a poetic sense, the sense of a storyteller. But when we get into the details that Paula and Nelson shared with us you see how bloody complicated it is, right? Mm -hmm. How incredibly difficult it is. Um, and so, for example, I'm no authority in the peace agreement of 2000, 20, 2016, but the very fact that there were 578 clauses, many of them were, were, were all about progressive um, um, uh, uh, aims of the FARC. You know, I mean, um, no, nobody's untainted in civil war. Uh, and certainly the FARC uh, lost their credibility through their actions. Um, but at the same time, the, the leftist movement began with a dream of, 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 a, of a better world. And, and when you look at what the FARC, at least on paper, were calling for, it's what the people want. They want economic opportunities. They want infrastructure. They want potable water. They want good schools. They want to access, you know, and, 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 and they don't want to live their lives waiting for their children to go off to the cities where the only place where they can scratch a living on the edges of a cash economy. So these 578 clauses of the agreement, which had this incredible price tag of $45 billion, um, you know, the, 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 those, are, those clauses were all about the development of infrastructure in the rural areas. And again, it's that economic development that stands in the face of violence, stands in the face of the cartels and so on. Mm -hmm. From what I got from Nelson, you cannot have one without the other. Right. Thank you, Wade. 
Um, I wanted to ask Paula a quick question and there's a group of questions for Nelson. So Paula, I wanted, you know, what some of the first comments were about the um, murders of social leaders. And I wonder if you could address that, the, the risks that are taken by those who, for example, seek land restitution or these collective reparations. Um, there was also a comment on the youth, um, the youth being killed. So I wonder if you had any comment on that. So, eh, eh, en las preguntas, digamos, hay dos temas en los que pues, aprovecharía para profundizar. Uno tiene que ver con el tema de la seguridad de los líderes. Y, y digamos, en mi presentación, la última slide, eh, en esta libertad que yo me tomé de parafrasear lo que podrían estar diciendo las mujeres en, en, en estos eh, de críticas o de puntos críticos de, del tema de justicia transicional, pues la frase es, nos están matando. Digamos que es una frase que se está utilizando lamentablemente de manera muy reiterativa desde los líderes sociales y es que pues existen en este momento pocas garantías de ejercicio de liderazgo social y político en Colombia. Colombia tiene este lugar muy eh, eh, vergonzoso de ser el país de América Latina que más eh, tiene de líderes asesinados y defensores de derechos humanos y esto, digamos, es, es uno de los, de, los, de, digamos, de los temas más importantes para, para evaluar lo que está pasando hoy con la justicia eh, transicional y con las reparaciones colectivas, etcétera. Pero también quería aprovechar para hacer un poco también la reflexión sobre lo que se podrían entender como las causas estructurales del conflicto, ¿no? Sí, que es un poco también la, la pregunta que se le hacía a Wade. Y yo creo que, digamos, aquí también es interesante verlo desde el enfoque de género porque eh, los informes que hicieron las mujeres sobre el conflicto armado y muchas eh, expertas sobre estos temas de, de género y, y conflicto armado siempre plantearon que existía como una especie de continuo de violencias, ¿no? Que eh, las violencias que vivían las mujeres o que estructurales que viven las mujeres, las condiciones de discriminación, eh, las condiciones de violencia, etcétera, eh, eh, representan un continuo que vino a ser exacerbado por el conflicto armado, pero que ya existía, o sea, ya había ya unas causas estructurales. Y cuando hablamos de represión de colectivos, para el caso de lo que estaba hablando yo hoy, pues, digamos también tiene mucho que ver el, el lugar que las mujeres tenían dentro de sus propias organizaciones políticas y sociales, la forma en que se vieron eh, 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 victimizadas. Entonces, claro, digamos, creo que desde el enfoque de género es muy interesante cómo nos hace ver eso, ¿no? que, que sí hay unas causas estructurales que, y que el conflicto lo que hizo fue eh, ensañarse contra las mujeres, contra grupos indígenas, contra los grupos afrocolombianos, pero porque existían esas formas de discriminación y de violencia también estructurales. Y ya que pues me ha dado la libertad de, de, de citar, en este caso sí voy a hacer una cita explícita de una mujer que escuché en un evento de reparaciones colectivas hace unos años y que expresaba este continuum de violencias así, esta sí es una cita textual, ella decía la mayoría éramos jóvenes, éramos las mandaderas, no tomábamos las decisiones, todas pertenecíamos a otras organizaciones, pero en cargos subalternos. Éramos las putas, las abandona hijos, las vagabundas. Si se hubiera visibilizado nuestro aporte, las cosas serían. Entonces creo que ahí es un, 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 una frase muy elocuente de cómo es, existe este continuum de violencia y cómo también ahí encontramos causas estructurales del conflicto sin lugar a dudas. Thank you, Paula. That, I think the complex, um, I guess, roots and all these aggravating factors of violence in Colombia is precisely the reason it's been decades, decades um, long, and that the, at least the 2016 agreement with the FARC is so complex. Um, so, you know, there's there's so much to talk about. We're getting more questions, but I'm going to ask uh, Nelson a few of the questions. Um, there's, there's some we can sort of link together, Nelson. Um, one person asked if the lack of um, FARC um, members, like key FARC members um, in the special jurisdiction is reducing the jurisdiction's uh, legitimacy. So they named um, Garcon and uh, Marquez and others. And 
given how slow the process is, um, are you expecting that there'll be a, a longer time period to deal with the cases or is that being addressed? Um, and is there, frust is there general frustration or do you feel there's frustration with, um, I guess, impunity um, for, for FARC members? And is that leading to some targeted um, killings of, of FARC or combatants or okay. demobilized combatants, I would hope, but <laughs> we don't know these days. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly, for the question. There are too many. I will try to summarize yeah. <laughs> to answer them. Uh, I start to say that the system is not going as slow. I believe it's going follow the normal standard of a speed of this kind of uh, justice. And uh, maybe uh, because justice doesn't matter what kind of justice is very slow for the victims. They are a frustration. That is normal. That happened in the traditional justice system. That could happen in transitional uh, uh, justice system. Uh, and the only advantage of the special jurisdiction of peace and the truth commission is that the truth are coming very fast, faster than any other kind of process. That is the only accomplishment we can celebrate right now. There are a lot of truth that are now delivered to the, from the system to the citizens. It's truth. Maybe my concern is that the cities, the frustration is because they are too much truth coming and maybe people was not ready to absorb too much truth uh, coming from the system. Uh, and I believe uh, for the future, maybe the, the, the new generations and the historians later will say, maybe the big uh, contribution of this uh, peace agreement was uh, the truth, even if the justice never arrived. Uh, and because if we know what happened, we can avoid to happen again and again. That is the, the, my, my main uh, uh, idea coming from this uh, situation. Uh, it's not easy to deliver justice uh, to all the victims, but if unless they get the truth, they get some things that was not possible before. For example, uh, Paola uh, could uh, uh, present the comparison of the, um, uh, uh, the uh, Act 975 adopted in 2006 at the time of the uh, incorporation of the paramilitary groups. Uh, at that time, was not truth, no justice. Uh, was uh, uh, very uh, bad situation for the victims because the victim didn't get the truth uh, with the paramilitary uh, uh, process. Now, uh, with the uh, peace agreement of uh, 2016, I left people get the truth. And maybe uh, as more than that uh, to this uh, uh, special uh, jurisdiction of peace could be too much uh, at this moment. Uh, this jurisdiction is still working uh, for 12 years more. It's not the case of the Truth Commission because the Truth Commission has only three years mandate. And um, some people are uh, arguing that because COVID, they merit more time. I don't have uh, the answer for that, uh, but the official or the legal mandate is for the Truth Commission is only three years going on till this November for the final report. But the special jurisdiction of peace has 12 years more to work and even five years more, uh, more later. And I believe at that moment, that means in 12 years, uh, now I can say we had truth, 
but I believe in 12 years, we had some kind of justice uh, too, uh, delivered by the special jurisdiction of peace. Even if the, the justice take time in 12 years, I believe some kind of justice will be delivered to the victim. Thank you, Nelson. Um, there are obviously a lot of questions, a lot of things happening right now too in Colombia. Um, so I think we're all looking forward to the final um, report of the, of the Truth Commission coming up later this year um, and watching for advances on the special cases um, in the special juris jurisdiction. Um, there are a number of other questions, but I wanted to touch base with the panelists and with Stephen if we should still go ahead with some more questions. Yeah. Um, there's still, is that okay? I, I, had a, I had a question here from John Packer. Yes. John yes. Packer. John Packer. Yeah. I, so I'm just going to have to jump in, Kimberly. It's Wade here. I, unfortunately, I had this scheduled just until the half hour. I've got okay. another call I've got to jump off for, unfortunately. I, I, uh, I don't mean to interrupt the proceedings, and I certainly want to thank Stephen and you and uh, Nelson and Paolo in particular. Uh, I learned so much from both of them, and I, I look forward to meeting them both in Colombia. Uh, and I'm, I, I do have to jump off for this other uh, webinar, unfortunately. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Wade. Yes. Um, your story was captivating at the um, from. I want the time. to take the, the question of John Packer because uh, he well, said can, that. The can we just hold on and say good a proper goodbye to Wade? Okay. He's leaving yeah. us, okay. and then we'll bounce it back to you. Nelson. Yeah, you bet. Okay. So, Wonderful. Thanks so much, Wade, and uh, we'll be in touch, and we'll let you know. Uh, uh, how, about the end of this discussion, because we probably have about 20 or 25 more minutes to go. Oh, okay, great. Thanks very much, everybody. Take Pleasure. care. Thank God you. Bless. Bye bye. Thank you. Yes, sorry, Nelson, go ahead. Do you want to respond to yes, John's uh, John Parker. question? Yes, John mm -hmm. Parker, question about the number of trials that take only 10 months. That is true, but we need to understand the difference. The uh, Nuremberg Tribunal was a bankers tribunal, uh, and uh, was the uh, uh, the victors tribunals, and was no uh, transitional justice, was no negotiated peace agreement, was a victors uh, uh, tribunal. The winners of the Second World imposed the tribunals, and they uh, uh, unilaterally uh, organized the trials and submit some uh, people to the tribunals. That is very different to this case where the um, special jurisdiction of peace is no, is no victors, is a agreement between different sides, the FAR and the state, and in order to deliver a transitional justice, and it's not possible to have winners and losers in this process. And in order to avoid winners and losses, it's not possible to go as fast as some people ask. And that is my understanding of this situation. This day, more time, is, is going very fast, deliver the truth, but it's going slowly to deliver the justice. Thank you, Nelson. Um, we have, we have a, a question here from um, Carlos Zapata about uh, rural reform, um, the first article of the 2016 Accord, um, and his position that it won't be implemented during in this current political environment or in this um, current government in Colombia. Um, and will it be possible to achieve sustainable peace without a more comprehensive rural reform? Wade already made reference, reference to that. Um, but would the, the peace accord work in the absence of such reform? Um, I wonder if Paula wants to look at that because Paula's been doing some work around um, women and um, a gender perspective in some rural development um, projects. And so 
do you need? Sí, de, de, digamos, yo no haría referencia específicamente al tema de reforma horaria integral porque pues, no, no tengo los elementos, pero sí, digamos, ahí, ahí en términos de reparación de las mujeres, en lo que tiene que ver con el acceso a la tierra, pues, digamos, se han mostrado múltiples dificultades desde que no existe información real que muestre, digamos, cuál es el estado real actual de acceso de las mujeres a la tierra, pero también, digamos, las dificultades que tienen las mujeres en los procesos de, en general de, de desarrollo rural, ¿no? La falta de acceso a insumos la falta de acceso a capacitación técnica, la falta de acceso a crédito y demás, pues todos estos se, se han convertido en barreras, que yo también diría que son barreras estructurales para que haya una reparación real en términos de género. Pero también vi en las preguntas que, que se, se hablaba un poco del tema de la voluntad política y cómo, digamos, un poco eh, había sido eh, primero el proceso con los paramilitares y ahora el proceso con las FARC. Y yo creo que esto se puede ver de, desde varias dimensiones, ¿no? Yo creo que se puede ver desde el punto de vista, bueno, no hemos tenido eh, la reparación, tenemos un programa que en general va muy atrasado, con muy pocos resultados, pero yo creo que también se puede ver desde otros puntos de vista, y es que hoy, a pesar, digamos, que el, el, el tema de, del contexto político en Colombia es complejo, pues el, el proceso de justicia transicional sigue eh, andando. Se, seguimos en este proceso de justicia transicional, las entidades siguen actuando y tenemos varios activos que yo no encuentro eh, eh, pequeños. Yo encuentro que, que en Colombia contar con este marco de, 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 de incorporación del enfoque de género y étnico, por lo menos a nivel jurídico, es una ganancia importante. Contar con un acuerdo de paz que tiene incorporado el enfoque de género de esta manera tan fuerte gracias al movimiento de mujeres es importante. Y contar con un movimiento de mujeres maduro que hoy le hace ese seguimiento técnico, que le hace, eh, que interpela las, las, los mecanismos de justicia transicional con conocimiento y con, y con, y con hacer vítico, pues creo que no es menos. Entonces yo pondría también el tema de la voluntad política en medio de esas otras situaciones que en últimas eh, eh, pues no, no, no se paran de los retos y las deficiencias importantes que hay, pero que también eh, pues nos hacen mirar con esperanza lo que está pasando y lo que va a venir. Thank you, Paula. Um, I've just been reflecting on some of the comments myself. I have to say, um, I'm working with Paula and another colleague right now on an evaluation of the mission to support the peace process of the OAS. And um, I think what's, so we're looking at all these different types of transitional justice processes territorial, you know, engagement, dialogue. And in, in one sense, of course, there's a very challenging um, peace accord. Colombia has always had a very advanced legal um, framework and a progressive constitutional court. And then when you go to the territory, to the, to the rural areas, you, you have a sort of, <laughs> it's an eye-opening experience. But on the other hand, I think what we're seeing is just a really high level of participation um, at the local level. And I think these, uh, that level of participation, of true and effective participation in these different mechanisms I think they take time. Um, there is a chance for frustration, um, but um, slowly things, <laughs> things are moving along. Um, having the funds overall for the government to implement, as someone noted, is a, will be a big challenge. Um, I just wondered if there are other questions I know um, Robert had a question, but I think he already had to leave. Um, he wanted to know about the rise of new criminality. Um, and if, although it preys on young and unemployed, is it based on the old politics of the FARC um, versus the state? Um, or the question is, is it based on that old um, paradigm or that old conflict, or is it more about criminal gangs um, being driven solely by greed and personal financial gain? Um, 
And can the reconciliation process or will the reconciliation process have any effect on this new criminal activity? Yes, they are a phenomenon of new criminality. And the only link with the former situation is the inequality. Uh, that is the only link. But the uh, real uh, or the political uh, uh, situation is different. Uh, because at the time of FAR, FAR control, uh, controlled the territory as a like a state authority. And when the FAR was in place, FAR was able to uh, govern the territory as a uh, on, uh, only authority of the place. What happened now? Now we don't have a new criminal organization controlling a territory. They, are only controlling some kind of illegal businesses. They are not, uh, they control some uh, elements of the territory, but only in order to run a, a specific business could be uh, transportation of cocaine uh, uh, or, or extraction of minerals, etc. But they are not uh, governing a territory as far did before, because at the time of far, they govern it a municipality and they uh, uh, deliver justice for intrafam intrafamiliar violen violences. They deliver justice in labor law. If the employer didn't pay the employee, they deliver justice for any uh, issue in the community. Now, the new criminal organization, they are not deliver justice in the area. They are only uh, organized illegal businesses uh, and no more than that. They are not organizing a, a civil society governing by them. Uh, that is a little different. And they are a big fragmentation because at the time of FAR, uh, we, uh, sometimes we say, OK, in this territory is controlled by FAR. This other is by the uh, state, Colombia state authorities. And they take care to don't cross the, the, the border. At the time of the K1 was the day, the, the situation. The K1 was controlled by the FAR and the other areas by the state authorities, and they never crossed the border. Now, it's very different because the new uh, criminal organizations are only running business, are, are not governing the territory, are, are not deliver justice to the member of the community, and uh, it's a more complicated situation. And the only link is the inequality. Inequality happened before, it's still going. And the other issue that is the same is that the Colombian state had three economies. We had the legal economy, we had the informal economy, and we had the illegal economy. And these three economies had the same um, um, uh, importance in the Colombian economy. That means the, uh, the illegal economy is almost the same amount of money that the legal economy but they are in the middle informal, uh, legal, informal, and illegal. And people, uh, for example, when I uh, present the case of the young people, uh, one young, one of the three had opportunity in the legal economy, one of the three had the opportunity in the informal economy, and the third one, the only opportunity is in the illegal economy. And that is the, uh, the, the situation for the new criminality because they are a, a third sector of the economy that is illegal economy and is almost the third of the uh, gross domestic product of Colombia is running in this illegal economy. And this is the only option for one of the three zones. And that is increasing the new criminality. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Nelson. I wanted to ask um, Paula for a last uh, comment and then, then we're going to wrap it up. Um, Paula, I wanted to um, ask if you have a comment on the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war during the armed conflict and any observations you have either on individual or collective reparations for women who've been victims of sexual violence. 
Sí, bueno, voy a aprovechar para decir que pues efectivamente pues uno de, de, de las luchas que ha tenido el movimiento social de mujeres en Colombia es que si visibilice la violencia sexual como un hecho de, de común de, de la guerra, como, como un hecho de común, que digamos tuvo un, unos fines concretos y que, que fueron parte parte de esos fines fueron desmovilizar, digamos, las, o, o desarmar, perdón, o desarticular perdón, los, las expresiones eh, 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 colectivas de las mujeres, su trabajo social, político, humanitario, eh, y eso pues obviamente eh, 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 hace que, 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 la, que la violencia sexual pues se tenga que entender como un tema asociado al conflicto armado, que hace parte de las estrategias de los grupos armados contra la población y contra las mujeres. Aprovecho aquí también para, para comentarles algo que me pareció interesante y es que eh, dentro de los decretos que expidió el Estado colombiano para reglamentar este tema de la reparación colectiva que fueron posteriores a la ley de víctimas, a la ley del año 2011, se crearon unas reglas específicas de reparación para los grupos indígenas y para los grupos eh, 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 afrocolombianos, para los pueblos afrocolombianos y allí también se, 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 se incorporaron unos temas interesantes en temas eh, de género y en lo que tiene que ver con la violencia sexual entonces estos, estos decretos y este marco jurídico hace el llamado a que se reconozca las formas de violencia sexual que sufrieron las mujeres indígenas y afrocolombianas dentro de sus, de, de sus, de sus eh, eh, comunidades pero además lo que el, la eh, el impacto que eso tiene dentro de los, eh, del, del acervo, del bien colectivo de esos pueblos. ¿sí? Entonces, la, la violencia sexual que sufrieron algunas de las mujeres indígenas no, y, y algunas de las mujeres afrocolombianas no puede ser considerada simplemente como unos hechos que se repitieron en varios casos, sino que tiene que verse como parte del daño que sufrió el colectivo cómo las relaciones de género, las relaciones intergeneracionales que se vieron fracturadas por estos, estos temas de violencia sexual deben hacer parte, deben considerarse como parte del daño que se le hizo al colectivo, desde lo cultural, desde lo social, desde lo político. Entonces yo creo que estos son también estándares importantes que, que hay que tener en cuenta y, 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 que, y que nos llaman solam no solamente a la violencia sexual desde el punto de vista de, de las mujeres individualmente, sino también como parte de esta optimización que sufrieron los grupos eh, indígenas y afrocolombianos en Colombia. Thank you. So then you're I taking a actual... Sorry. I had a last comment about the collective uh, acknowledgement of the victims. And the special jurisdiction of peace has already recognized 230 groups, between them many women, uh, and that uh, or uh, Aboriginal communities, Afro uh, Colombian communities, and that is very important because uh, in normal uh, situation the victim is individual, but in the special jurisdiction of peace they are the possibility to recognize as a victim a group, and a collective uh, group of people and the uh, special jurisdiction of peace has already recognized 230 uh, groups. Thank you. I think on Paula's slide, she had a total like application of over 700 groups yeah. um, starting the process, but they, they haven't um, all been sort of moved along in that the route we saw. Um, But, en el proceso administrativo de reparación. Yes. Uh, right. But it's a different process because that's a reparation. Okay. And here I am talking about a special jurisdiction. Oh, in the this. courts, right. Yeah. Um, but I think in both, we've seen that there's a certain level of both cultural rights, collective rights of indigenous and Afro-Colombians and also um, with a gender focus and women's groups also recognized as collectives, at least in the administrative uh, collective reparations process. So I wanted to thank both of you for your responses and for our um, participants for all their interesting questions. And um, I hope a sufficient number were able to um, understand both <laughs> Spanish and English in, it, uh, in our bilingual session today. So uh, I'm gonna pass it back to Stephen. 
Thanks, Kim. Um, the fact that we have 23 people left suggests that there are many multilingual participants uh, today, and that's a, that's a really great sign. So before um, thanking the panelists in particular and our partners, I'd like to just flag two um, strategic takeaways uh, that I'm, I'm carrying with me uh, from this, this fascinating and, and very rich conversation today. Uh, and the first is, is about time. I, I really appreciated Nelson's distinction between the uh, time frame for truth uh, and a, a, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission being able to deliver a lot more truth than Colombians have had access to uh, in three years. Uh, 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 in, so just in these three short years, but that being very different from the 12, 15, or maybe even 20 year time frame that will probably be required for uh, all of the, uh, even the exemplary cases, which are, let's remember, it's just a sample of the universe, right? But the exemplary cases uh, uh, are being treated by the, the special jurisdiction in, in an effective way. And that being, again, very different from the time frame that it would require to actually address a whole range of other uh, problems, such as discrimination against uh, ethnic minorities or women or violence against uh, both and many others that are, are related to, to conflict and, and, and violence uh, dynamics uh, in, in the country. Um, I, I'm equally taken by, by Paula's insistence uh, and coming back to uh, the insistence that, you know, given these, these time frames, in fact, in order to make sure <laughs> that the, um, the uh, uh, substantive uh, advances uh, uh, to, to which the, the, the 2016 Accords have opened the door, that they don't get lost in this long time frame, you know, 3, 12, 15, 20, uh, and in particularly in order to make sure that the, the deeper issues, if you will, beyond the prosecution of those directly accused of massive human rights violations, that the deeper issues don't just fall off the agenda and get forgotten. Uh, as I've seen happen in too many other peace processes that I've worked in and on over the past 30 years, including in Guatemala, which also had great peace accords, right? But uh, you know, uh, very few, if very few structural reforms were actually implemented uh, uh, or have been implemented in the, uh, uh, the 30 years since the 1994 Comprehensive Accords uh, in, in Guatemala. So in order to avoid that in Colombia, to the extent that it's possible, three major elements are required. Political will of the state, indispensable and that can be nurtured, right? It's uh, uh, technical assistance and financial assistance and political pressure from the international community, the UN, Canada, Friends of Colombia, et cetera, are very important. But just as important, if not perhaps more, particularly ensuring and ensuring that these structural issues, the deep inequities get addressed in a serious consequential way is pressure from below, including pressure from uh, organized uh, ethnic uh, indigenous peoples communities and their federations and their associations, including uh, pressures from uh, women's organizations uh, uh, and, uh, and their, their federations across, across Colombia uh, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, without that third element in particular, uh, I'm, I must say that based on my experience in other contexts, I fear, I fear that um, even 12 years won't be enough. Uh, and then in fact, that the, 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 bigger, the bigger problems will get uh, forgotten. Uh, uh, that, that nothing close to the investment, political, financial, and other investments that it would take to make those reforms happen. Will, will occur, even in a country that's as wealthy uh, as Colombia. So I, I don't want to end on, on a, a negative note because I, I take Paula's insistence on that third element as a call to action and a call for also uh, international friends of Colombia to support those women's organizations and indigenous people's organizations and peasant organizations and victims associations and so on, who are, uh, who have a vested interest in ensuring that uh, peace does not just remain uh, on paper in Colombia. 
So thank you so much to uh, all the panelists, including Wade, for your, your brilliant presentations and answers to, to these difficult questions. Um, thanks to all the participants for sticking with us uh, to the end and for asking really good questions along the way. I'm super happy personally to see that some of my students uh, who work on these issues are still online. That's quite exciting. Uh, thanks to our partners, uh, first of all, to Kim and uh, Asa of the Just Governance Group and Paula of the Just Governance Group uh, in co-crafting this, this, uh, this uh, project, this initiative together. Thank you also to uh, Carolina Shimada and Rob Reddy and others from the Latin America and Caribbean Group of the Canadian International Council for uh, also contributing to, to making this, this a success. And last but not least, thank you so much to uh, my dear colleagues at the at SIPS, the Canadian Institute for Peace and Security and our Fragile States Network uh, for hosting this and for graciously allowing to go considerably over time, uh, but hopefully, so thanks everybody, including Andrew the technician for sticking with us over time. And uh, hopefully this will have been worthwhile for, for all of you. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you and good night, everyone. Good night, everyone, and to be continued in another time.